Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, both in person and on the live stream at today's Illuminate Speaker Series. My name is Katie Dick. I'm a master's student here at the College of Rehabilitation Sciences. And my research involves the development of digital health core competencies for physiotherapists. And I work in the area of digital health um, at Shared Health in Manitoba. Uh, I'm happy to be uh, introducing Jacqueline Frank today. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting her at this year's National eHealth Conference in Toronto. And I was fascinated at uh, the innovative use of technology in her practice. And I'm really glad she can share it with you today. Uh, Jacqueline's going to give us a presentation and then there's time for questions. For those of you in the room, if you could use the microphone for questions um, because the session is being recorded and for those of uh, people following along on the live stream. So um, Jacqueline Frank graduated from the University of Manitoba in 2010 with a degree in physical therapy. She worked on orthopedic units at Foothills Medical Hospital and Rocky View General Hospital before joining the Allied Health Rehabilitation Wound Care Team at Rocky View in Calgary in 2011. Since starting with the wound care team, she completed her Canadian Association of Wound Care Levels and worked closely with the College of Physiotherapists of Alberta to become one of the only physiotherapists in Canada to inject local anesthetics. Uh, so Jacqueline's uh, presentation is titled Otherworldly Immersion Using Virtual Reality to Ease Anxiety and Pain in Complex Wound Care. Uh, Jacqueline, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, and just to let you know, Jacqueline, there, there's kind of a mix of people in the room. So we have some physiotherapists, some occupational therapists, uh, some nurses, some people with child health, I believe, child life. Uh, so it's kind of a nice mix in the room. Okay, perfect. Um, so like Katie said, my name is Jacqueline. I'm one of the wound care physiotherapists here at Rocky View. Um, I guess we'll jump right into it. i get my disclaimer out of the way first. So our virtual reality project is, an, an, is not an official um, Alberta Health Services project. This was a project that we were just kind of able to run with and do, but it's not an official project of AHS. Um, unfortunately, I'm not funded <laughs> by Oculus or Samsung or the developers of any of the apps that I'm going to talk about today or that we use. And I do have a few patient pictures um, in my presentation today, and those pictures were obtained with consent um, to be used for this presentation and for education purposes. So I thought I would first of all start talking uh, just a little bit about what physios and OTs here in Alberta are doing for wound care. Um, it is a little bit different between the provinces and quite often when I tell people that I'm a wound care physiotherapist, um, the most common response I get is, oh, okay, great, so you do exercises on wounds? And not, not quite. Um, so our inclusion criteria and the patients that we see, um, it's within our scope of practice to be able to debride any form of necrotic tissue. Um, so quite often the people that we're seeing um, have fairly extensive, quite often necrotic wounds, and we're able to help clean those up. Um, we are work fairly closely with the plastic surgeons in the hospital here, and so we will do their minor debridements for them and get the patient ready for any sort of surgical intervention that they do. Um, so that includes cutting away um, skin, fat, muscle. We are able, I have a little picture of a rangeur on the left uh, bottom corner there, so we are able to take uh, small chunks of necrotic bone. Um, so we're doing some fairly extensive wound care here, um, as well as any sort of complex cleansing, so anything with the deep sinus. We are kind of the compression people in the hospital, so anything that requires complex compression, they're coming to see us. Um, we manage flaps and grafts along with our plastic surgeons and get them to the point where they're able to manage at home. Um, Anybody who has complex medical factors, such as people with diabetes, um, we're helping manage their wounds. And like I said, anything that has exposed tendon, bones, muscles, vessels, um, we're often the ones who are consulted and we work along with plastic surgery to help manage those wounds and heal those wounds. Uh, like Katie had mentioned, within Alberta, we are permitted to inject local anesthetics to help manage pain. 
Um, and I thought I just would throw this in here because it's a fairly new development within Alberta. Um, it is an advanced skill, um, so not everybody is able to do it, um, but it is helping us manage pain. None of our patients are put to sleep. All of our patients are alert and oriented when they come and see us and get these debridements done. Um, so local anesthetics is kind of one thing that we've been using to help manage pain. Unfortunately, it's not for everybody. For example, if a wound covers the entire surface of a lower leg, well, you can't freeze all of that wound, so that's where virtual reality um, comes in and plays a role. And just to note that we're not prescribers of local anesthetics. A physician still must prescribe it, but we are able to inject it. So on to the virtual reality part. Um, so this, I wish I could say this was completely my idea, <laughs> but it wasn't. Um, over the past three years, Dr. Spiegel at the Cedar sinai Medical Center has been using virtual reality um, on, for numerous procedures, uh, for numerous reasons, and they were finding great results. And so Scout Windsor and Don Anderson are two of the people that I've worked closely with here at Rocky View. They are part of our telehealth team. Um, and they were kind of reading all these articles and seeing what was happening in the States, but there was very little research and uh, very little even written about people uh, doing this in Canada. So they went to our senior management at the hospital and asked, hey, can we buy a virtual reality system and start using it here? And yeah, our senior management was very supportive and they said, yes, but we want to see it used clinically. We want you to have a purpose for this. And so that's where I came into the mix because I hurt people and I cause anxiety. Um, and so they thought wound care physiotherapy would be a great launching point because of its, um, because of the patient population that we see, the procedures that we perform. Um, we're doing debridements, we're doing dressing changes, and our patients, like I said, are alert and awake throughout the whole thing. So we are at Rocky View Hospital. We are the first hospital in Canada to be using virtual reality to help manage pain and anxiety. During complex wound care, this is my bragging page. Um, but yeah, so the current system that we're using is uh, the Oculus system. Um, we started out with a very original system, um, but this one's quite a bit cheaper. It's very easy. We went out and we bought it at Best Buy is how complicated it gets. Um, and about the cost to deploy this system is only $400, which in the grand scheme of things, when you're thinking about how much you can spend on pain medication, dressing changes, all that kind of stuff, $400 to have a system that you can reuse from patient to patient multiple times. Um, people have been pretty impressed with the cost. We did have to make some minor alterations to the system. Um, we work closely with infection prevention and control. Anytime you're using the same device on multiple patients, IPNC always wants to have a look at that. Um, so we did have to buy a different cover for it. Um, the original cover that goes on your face was made of kind of a fabric felt lining. So um, we changed that to a wipeable cover. Um, all of our patients have to wear um, a bonnet or a head cover, and we got special wipes that were appropriate for um, to use on electronics. So we kind of had to work with IPNC to make sure that we were able to um, properly disinfect and clean this device for uh, use on multiple people. Our inclusion and exclusion criteria, so patients who are experiencing high levels of pain, um, and this is despite kind of best medical management, so we're not taking away pain meds from patients, um, but quite often we're having patients come down who are maxed out on the amount of narcotics that they can receive, um, and they're still experiencing 9 or 10 out of 10 pain. Uh, high anxiety, so sometimes patients don't have pain, but they are so anxious about their dressing change and having to look at their wound that, um, you know, it's a really high anxiety situation for them. We have had people use virtual reality who don't have pain or anxiety, but they just don't want to watch. So, for example, I had a patient who had a diabetic foot ulcer. He didn't have any pain because of neuropathy. 
he wasn't particularly anxious, but he said, Jackie, I don't like watching you cut chunks out of my foot. <laughs> and I, that's fair. That's fair enough. So he has to use virtual reality just because he didn't want to watch his dressing changes. Um, they have to have good vision. We did try it on somebody once who we thought had good vision. And unfortunately, he's during the treatment session, he's going like, I, like, I can't see anything. I don't think this is working. And so I quickly took it off and kind of put it on me to see what he was looking at. And he had a dinosaur about five inches away from his face looking directly into his eyes on the virtual reality machine. So I kind of had to say, oh, I don't think this is for you because there's a dinosaur looking you straight in the eyes. So <laughs> if you can't see that, it's, we'll, we'll try something else. Um, obviously, they have to be, be able to provide uh, informed consent. And they have to be able to sit up during their treatment. So um, quite often, if you're in sideline looking through the virtual reality, it can mess uh, with your uh, kind of your vision and your brain sees everything as upright, but your body senses that you're sideways, and it can cause some nausea in our patients. Obviously, we don't want to treat any patients who are in an active delirium, poor vision, like I said. Uh, any sort of head or neck wound, because we're using this on multiple patients, um, we're unable to see, treat our patients with head and neck wounds with the VR. Obviously, body parasites are an obvious one. Eye infection or droplet or airborne isolation. I should note that IPNC has cleared us to use this on patients who are MRSA and VRE positive, so who are on contact isolation, um, as long as they don't have a head or neck wound. So. I'm just going to let you guys read this quote and I'll give you, I'll tell you a bit about this gentleman's story. Um, this was a patient who was found down in his apartment for an extended period of time. He developed bilateral compartment syndrome to both of his legs and had to have fasciotomies done to both legs. He ended up requiring pretty extensive wound care, as later on those wounds couldn't be closed, um, as well as skin grafting. And he had a lot of pain, um, despite trying to manage it uh, medically, the doctors as best as they could. He had a PCA pump, and he was still coming down in 10 out of 10 pain. Um, so we thought we would try virtual reality on him, and actually within the first treatment, his pain and anxiety went from a 10 to a 2. So, and that's not changing pain meds, that's not taking away pain meds, but a significant difference just by applying virtual reality. Um, and so he used that every time he came down from there on out, and he actually got quite good at it and would manipulate it and watch different scenes, so... Um, yeah, this, the virtual reality really helped him, and he's actually the one who, um, when we did a little media release, he was the patient who was able to talk about his experience using VR. So the apps that we're using are pretty basic. Um, on the top left-hand corner, if you can see a campsite there, that's probably our most commonly used app. It's called Happy Place, and we start most of our patients off in Happy Place. It's, uh, it's really just a campsite where you're sitting, you're enjoying the view, um, but it changes just enough that it keeps patients engaged. So, for example, the sun will go down, the northern lights come out, it will start to rain, a deer will walk by. So there's enough going on that it keeps patients engaged. Um, we find we did try some of the more complicated games, so um, some strategy games using the controller, but we found with the more complicated virtual reality um, experiences, that patients would become frustrated and they would disengage. So, for example, they'd lose at the game that they were trying to play, and then they're disengaged from the VR, and they're back in the wound care room, and they can feel the pain. Um, so we've been keeping it pretty basic. People like Graydon, who was on the previous slide, um, he would kind of work the VR to however he felt he needed. So, for example, we have Cirque du Soleil, virtual reality um, experiences. So when we were taking his dressing off, that was the most painful part for him. So he would go into Cirque du Soleil during the most ex 
uh, during the most uh, painful part of his dressing change because there was so much going on that he was very engaged in the in the experience that he didn't feel it as much. And then afterwards, once the painful part were the most painful part was over, he would go into happy place um, for the rest of his treatment. So he kind of learned how to work the virtual reality system to work best for him. And so this is a list of the uh, virtual reality experiences or apps that we're using. We usually let people pick out what appeals most to them. Um, and we do have kind of triggers along the side just so people are aware. Um, I mean, obviously, Jurassic World, if you're scared of dinosaurs, probably won't be your first choice. But there's other ones that are a little bit less obvious. Um, for example, if you're a burn victim, maybe watching one of the Cirque du Soleil's where there's ninjas who are literally twirling fire in, like, you know, two feet away from your face, that might be traumatic for somebody who's suffered a recent burn. Um, so we do have, you know, certain triggers. Even a bonfire at a campsite might be a trigger for a patient who, who suffered from a burn. So we did want to kind of make people aware of what's in the application so that they knew what they were getting into. Uh, the only one that doesn't have a trigger is called Henry, and it's about a hedgehog who celebrates his birthday, and I <laughs> really couldn't find anything that would set anybody off in that one. So, so we had a pretty basic method um, of how we did our study. Um, patients were identified after their first wound care treatment as being somebody who either had high pain or anxiety, despite kind of best medical management of their pain medications. Um, so we, the patient would come down to the wound room, we would see them. To be honest, it probably wouldn't go well because of their pain and anxiety. Um, so they'd be identified as somebody who would benefit from VR. Um, we would have them complete a pretest. So they would rate their pain, anxiety, and nausea. We included nausea in there just because we wanted to make sure that uh, the virtual reality wasn't making people nauseated. Some of the applications can, so we wanted to make sure we included that. Um, and then they also were rated um, how they felt about returning. When we said, you have to come back tomorrow, how does that make you feel? And their overall experience. The next, usually the next day, the patients would come down for their next treatment session, and we would put the VR on them and complete a similar treatment session with them. Um, and then we'd have them answer the same questions, so rating their pain, anxiety, nausea, um, as well as their experience. And we would also ask them, did you find the VR helpful? So these are our early results. Um, the survey showed about a 68% reduction in discomfort, so pain and anxiety dropped by 68%, and a 25% over improvement in overall patient experience. I like to think that that patient experience um, would actually should have been a higher percentage, but in the surveys, you know, patients rate pain as a 10, anxiety as a 10, but they rated their overall experience as great, and I think they were trying maybe just not to hurt our feelings. But um, something also noteworthy is that 100% of patients found the VR helpful. So there wasn't anybody that we put the VR on who said, I didn't like that. Um, now, that's only out of about 18 to 20 people, but still, for 100% of patients to feel that it helped them in some way um, was really great to see. Something that kind of surprised us and we didn't think that we would find during our study was that the wound care staff had lower levels of distress while we were doing our treatments. So contrary to what my patients might tell you, I don't like to hurt people, but unfortunately that happens with my job. Um, and we do get a lot of moral distress when you have to change a dressing and a patient is having 10 out of 10 pain or very high anxiety, and you're having to put them through that, um, we do find that, you know, sometimes you walk away and you feel like you've been hit by a bus because it upsets me to have to upset somebody else. And we found that when our patients were using the VR, we were walking away 
feeling so much better with ourselves, going, oh, wow, I feel so much lighter, I feel so much better, because my patient's pain and anxiety were controlled. Um, so that wasn't something we were expecting to find, but it was a really um, interesting finding. So some of the highlights kind of while we were doing this study is we've this is a little bit old. We've, this is 20 plus patients. I'd say we're well beyond that at this point. Um, we've used it during skin grafting procedures. So quite often our plastic surgeons, if a graft is small enough, will just do it under local anesthetic in our wound room. Um, and so we do have patients who get their surgeries done down here with us. And I love this picture because this is a gentleman who required a skin graft to help heal his wound. And because he was a bit medically complex, as well as the fact that it was a small enough skin graft, uh, the plastic surgeon wanted to do it within our wound room under local anesthetic. And the patient wanted to be put out. Like, knock me out, I wanna go to the OR, I do not want this done in the wound room. So we thought, well, why don't we put the VR on you during your skin grafting and um, and that might help, you know, settle some of your anxiety. And so we put him in Happy Place, so that campsite um, application. And I just love this picture because he's almost like he's got a smile on his face, and you can tell by his body language that he's somewhere else completely. And one of my favorite moments actually was the surgeon was just splashed a little bit of saline on his wound and our patient kind of jumped and we said, oh, like, are you okay? How are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm doing fine. He's like, it's raining in the virtual reality and I thought it was starting to rain on me. And so that just really tells you how immersed he was in into his environment. He wasn't in the wounds room. He wasn't getting a skin graft. He was at a campsite and it had started to rain. So um, I thought that was really neat. We do have other units within our hospital exploring how they are gonna incorporate the virtual reality into their um, care delivery, and as well as within other hospitals in Calgary. So I've uh, been over to the Foothills and to PLC and as well as South Health Campus and they're all interested in how they can incorporate um, using virtual reality um, at their hospitals. So this is another uh, bit of a bragging slide, but um, we were able to present at Digital Health Canada and as well as the Quality and Safety Summit at U of C. And then Ben and Ben Mulroney and myself got to hang out one morning on the Your Breakfast television show in Toronto. Um, so it's, it's really neat. It's nice to get the word out um, about virtual reality and its benefits. And I just think being one of the first ones in Canada to use it this way, um, we're just being innovative and other people are really uh, taking an interest in it. So like I said, we are looking at expanding this project. Um, the CCU and the ICU are both looking at using virtual reality. Um, they're actually running a study right now. They're using it more for relaxation purposes. Um, our ICU here at Rocky View doesn't have windows. Um, so it is a nice escape for patients uh, to use the virtual reality that way. Um, I should actually mention we have also used it on patients just for the purpose of, I guess you could say escaping. Um, we have had a few patients who have had extremely long hospital stays, um, one patient in particular who was here for months, um, and they started to have panic attacks in the morning up on the nursing unit just from a prolonged hospital stay. And so in the mornings, I would head up, put the virtual reality on this patient, and he would do a guided meditation in the mornings on the beach. So put him on a beach, I think it's a beach in Australia actually, and a voice over the VR system would walk him through a guided meditation. Um, so definitely this is kind of along the lines of more what ICU is investigating. Um, but yeah, it's it can be used for more than just pain and anxiety and wound care. We're using it on patients who are having anxiety up on the nursing unit or just need to escape the nursing unit for a couple minutes. So. Um, 
the other departments at our hospital who are currently uh, looking into using the virtual reality are the women's health unit, so they are looking into using it for labor and delivery. Uh, emergency and day surgery are both looking at using it. Burns and plastics, um, we don't get a ton of burns here at Rocky View. Most of them go to Foothills Medical Center, um, but their unit is looking at purchasing a virtual reality system. And actually there are specific um, applications for burns that can be used on these systems. So um, quite often it's you're playing in snow and throwing snowballs and they find that that's very effective for burns. Um, our mental health unit is looking at unit, using it as well as the vascular units um, at other hospitals for their wound care. So like I said, this wasn't um, a solo project. This was, I had the help of Don Anderson and Scout Windsor and they are amazing from the technical side of things. Um, I mean, I don't even have a video so I can stream you guys, so they're my techie people. <laughs> um, but they've helped me a lot um, along this journey. And I mean, it hasn't come without its, you know, trials and tribulations. Definitely anytime you're using technology, um, there are always glitches. Um, it did take, a, I mean, and there definitely were times where we wanted to use virtual reality and it didn't end up happening that day because the technology just wasn't going to cooperate with us. Um, with our older system, it was a phone connected to a headset and, you know, the phone would always come up and pop up it needs updates or um, the battery's dead or the remote control battery's dead. So, you know, there was a lot of... Um, collaboration with Don and Scout in the beginning to help work out the technical issues, um, as well as getting our staff trained. Um, so that was one thing that we found very helpful was our staff, which was actually really fun, spent multiple days just playing with the VR system. Um, and that way we're able, you know, if a patient says, oh, I'm seeing this, like what's going on? we're able to help them without having to take off the set headset, stop our wound care, kind of disengage them. Um, so yeah, that was part of um, what Scout and Dawn did is they gave training to our wound care staff so that we could operate the VR system and the headsets and somewhat know what we're doing. This is just the reference from um, that study that I mentioned earlier with Dr. Spiegel at Cedars sinai and yeah, that was a quick presentation, but um, if anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Jacqueline. I, I suspect there's lots of uh, heads spinning in the room about uh, different applications for this uh, in, in our own practice here. Uh, it's really fascinating to hear what you're doing. Uh, does anybody yeah. have any questions for Jacqueline? Hi, Jacqueline. I'm Mernan. I work in child life. And my question is, have you used or know anybody who might be using it in a pediatric application? Oh, sorry. I think you just cut out there. I only got the tail end of your question. Sorry. Uh, Myrna from Child Life. And just wondering if anybody's been using or if you've had use with pediatric populations using the virtual reality. Uh, we haven't. We don't have any peds at our hospital here. Um, I do meet, well, we meet as a wounds group monthly, and so our wound care therapist at um, the Children's Hospital has had some interest. For their wound care, they do um, have an anesthesiologist, and so um, their children are actually they're put out for their wound care. Um, but I know that there have been lots of uses um, with pediatric populations. For example, running them through what they're going to experience prior to going into an operating room. So who you're going to see, what you're going to experience. And they found that that actually lowers um, the anxiety levels in children prior to a big procedure. Hello, uh, my name is Jessica and I'm also a child life specialist at Children's. Uh, yeah, we've been looking into virtual reality a lot. There's a lot of different ways you can go with it, um, with IT support, without. Um, so 
I, I guess we can contact you as a as a resource for kind of exactly what you have. I mean, we d I did write it down, but um, just kind of if we have further questions. Oh, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're happy to help after our presentations. We usually get a few emails of people wondering how they can get it started. Um, I will say that we were lucky here. We kind of slipped under the radar and didn't have to go through IT. Um, to start this project, so we kind of skipped a little bit of the red tape that way, um, but we're happy to help you kind of figure out um, our conversations with IP and C, um, how we got started, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, feel free to email me and I can give you all of all the information. Great, thank you very much. Hi, Jacqueline, thanks a lot for your presentation, it's Barb Shea. Um, Hello. I was the one waving at you before. Oh, <laughs> I wish I had a camera. I was waving back, but you oh, can't yeah. tell. Okay. <laughs> um, so I just uh, had a couple questions just about budget and costing and whatever. So you said something about cost per deployment was $400 Canadian. Are you just mm -hmm. talking about adding up all of the expenses, or are you talking about like for a session of VR during a procedure, that's approximately what it costs? Oh, no, sorry, that's the total cost of getting the system going. Um, so we spent our $400 and that's it. And we've used it probably on over 50 patients now. Perfect. And just that startup cost. Yeah. Right. And so um, I wonder if you guys have plans to do an analysis on, you know, sort of how much, if any, that it saves the healthcare system. In addition to the patient indicators, that sounds fantastic, but is there also um, sort of like a, a cost-benefit analysis going on at the same time? Um, we haven't looked into that. I know there are people right now who are wanting to look into, you know, reducing narcotic use. Um, and using the virtual reality as a substitute, but that involves a whole ethics uh, ethics meeting and, and that kind of thing. So nobody has actually looked into the total cost reduction um, yet, but I know there are people who are wanting to look into that. Uh, Jacqueline, I had a question. It's Katie, hello. Hello. Hi. Um, so on the, the table that you showed with all the different applications that you're using, uh, one of your columns had um, the categories listed as relaxation, immersive, and experience. Um, just yeah. For, yeah. Could you maybe describe the difference between those three, oh, sure. those three things? Here, I'll go back. <laughs> uh, there we go. Um, and so, so relaxation is essentially a very, very passive um, application so you are just sitting there and you don't need to do a thing so there's you don't need to use the remote um, things happen around you and you're kind of just watching time go by um, immersive is more that the characters and uh, the uh, application is interacting with you so um, for example, like I said, in Jurassic World, that dinosaur, it's not like a T-Rex or anything. It's an Apatosaurus. <laughs> but it's, uh, that dinosaur gets up and walks over to you and smells you. Um, so it's, uh, more immersive, like you're, you're part of it. Um, the interactive, that's when you're using the controller. And this is, we're not using the interactive on a ton of people just because, I mean, we're using this on people in their 80s. So sometimes using that controller and getting that controller going is a little bit much. Our younger population definitely um, more so is using the interactive experiences. So for example, in Night Sky, um, you have to connect some stars and once you connect them, it takes a shape like a pirate ship and then the pirate ship swirls around and, and so you're actually interacting with the app. Um, and then we listed the Cirque du Soleil as an experience, um, just because it is a live show. It's not a cartoon. Um, it is real people in a real Cirque du Soleil show that's happening right in front of you. So it's a little bit different and um, kind of immersive in a different way. Okay, great, thanks. I have a couple of follow-ups from that. So um, based on those sort of differences, are, have you guys looked at the difference in your pain management around whether they're using those different types of, uh, of, of experiences? 
if it varies? Yeah, absolutely. So like I mentioned, um, our one patient, Graydon, was very, like, he would go into a Cirque du Soleil show for his dressing removal, um, and that's the most painful part. So he was completely immersed in the Cirque du Soleil because everywhere you look, something's going on. Um, and so, and then he would go into a happy place once the dressing was removed and his pain had subsided a little bit. He still needed the VR, but not quite on that level. Um, like I said, we're starting people in the happy place because it's a fairly uh, calm, you don't have to interact, you don't have to do anything, but it's enough to keep you engaged. So we'll usually start them in happy place just to make sure that they're comfortable with the VR. Um, and then we allow them to choose what they would like. Sometimes for our younger population, and if they're having really high pain, I'll suggest a Cirque du Soleil show um, because it is so immersive and so distracting um, that we find, you know, the more engaging ones work a little bit better. Um, we have found with a little bit of our older population that and this is just from our experience. It's not for everyone, but I mean, we have just found that sometimes the more immersive ones are a lot. <laughs> and uh, we did put somebody in the Jurassic World when she thought she'd like to watch dinosaurs and she ended up, she was screaming and like, you know, kind of jokingly, but still it was too much. <laughs> so we always start people in happy place and then we kind of give them this list and let them decide where they think they want to go from there. Okay, great, thanks. Are there any more questions? Oh. Hi there, um, I'm from Rehab. Um, I'm just wanting to know, um, uh, first of all, where you get the apps? Like, is it through the system or is it through, like, where are you searching for these apps? Yeah, so it's through the Oculus system. Okay. Um, so essentially, when you're setting up your system, we've bought the VR. Um, I have just the app on my phone. Um, and so I downloaded the apps onto my phone, which then downloads onto the VR system. After they're downloaded onto the VR system, I don't need to use my phone anymore. Um, so that doesn't become a part of it. So you can run these apps. We're located in the basement of the hospital. We have very shoddy Wi-Fi. Mm. <laughs> so these apps run um, without the need for Wi-Fi, without the need for connecting to a phone. Once they're downloaded onto the actual headset, they can be used anywhere, anytime. So just to follow up with that then, is just your phone connected to that VR system or is there several phones or? It is just my phone okay. right now, um, just because this is my baby project. Right. But, um, <laughs> But like I said, I mean, I never go into my phone and update the apps anymore because they're on the headset. So it's just that initial download. And I think for me to download all of these apps was about $40, so not hugely expensive either. Right. That's great. And and so have you had any experience with it with uh, patients with CRPS? Have you ever tried it with... No, we've we've really only used it um, on our wound care patients here, but uh, that's about it. Okay. We're trying to expand to other units, but again, that whole IT factor comes into play, and so they've been a little bit slower to get off the ground. Great, thank you. Jessica again from Child Life. Um, as far as updating the apps that are on there, is, do you have to do frequent updates? No. App? So that's the, with, the, with our old system, um, it was a phone connected to a headset, right. and that required updates because the phone needs updates. Um, but now that we have the new Oculus system going, I don't have to update it at all, um, which is really nice. Yes. So... I mean, in the past, we've been using our new system now for about a year and a half, and I haven't updated it. Hi. Sorry. Child life. Just lots of questions down this way. Um, oh, I love the question. <laughs> um, I had a question. Are there applications where two people can interact at the same time? So one sees in like on the virtual reality, and another person either 
interacts with them on their phone so that they can see what the other person is seeing or have games where you can play together, like making it up tennis or something that you can kind of interact with at the same time. Mm -hmm. See, this is where John and Scout are like my, my people. But um, I know there are ways that you can um, download something onto your phone so that you can see what your patient is seeing. Um, so that's definitely a possibility. I don't know about the interaction, to be honest. Um, and I, I couldn't give you an I can't give you an answer because I don't know, but I can find out. If you send me an email, I'll ask um, Don and Scout and they'll know for sure. Anybody else have any questions? Maybe Jacqueline, while we're, we're wrapping up questions, do you have a slide that has your email address on it that you could, oh, yeah. you could pop to Sorry. maybe and then people can jot it down? There we go. Any other questions from anybody? Great. Well, I suspect you'll be hearing from a few people <laughs> that were with us today. <laughs> and um, I believe the presentation gets posted online. Is that correct, too? So for those of you who maybe want to go back and access some of the information, it's the live stream is, is posted. Uh, I, I think it's on the, is it on our college site? Or they can just uh, search, search Illuminate series and it will come up? Yeah, it's on the college site. Oh, perfect. So it's on the appointment link, and it's also on the College of uh, Rehabilitation Sciences, I think, homepage at the bottom right, I believe. You can click on the Illuminate button there. So thank you, everyone, for joining us, and thanks for those who joined us on the live stream. And thank you, Jacqueline, very much. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Great to talk with you.